I just want to thank the four, uh, the five of you, or four of you. There we go, four of you for uh, for joining on. Um, it certainly means a lot to me. Uh, certainly means a lot to the Mets section. I think this speaks volumes for the Mets section that within about an hour, um, I was able to get four four of the best pros not only in the section but in the country. Um, and I know I, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out, kind of saying how how shocked they are and how excited they are for this opportunity. So the first, th first thing is we just want to thank you guys for that. Um, and just to introduce our panelists to everybody out there, um, our first one is Matt Dobbins from Meadowbrook Club, um, two-time National Club Pro Champion, 2015 National and Section Player of the Year, uh, competed in 18 PGA Tour events, including some majors in there, as well as playing for the University of Texas. Um, we also have Daryl Kessner, uh, Deepdale Golf Club, over 30 years experience, winner of the 96 National Club Pro. Is that correct, Daryl? That's correct, yeah. Just want to make sure I got that one right. Yeah. <laughs> Love Two, that we go. All right, 2017, um, Daryl won the highest award for PGA Professionals as the Golf Professional of the Year. Uh, has had played in over 50 PGA Tour events. Now, I want to make sure I got this right, Daryl, because this was amazing to me. Eight U.S. Open, 11 PGA Championships, two senior opens, 10 British senior opens, um, and certainly one of the most sought out after short game coaches out there. Um, good friend of mine, Sean Quinn, living out of the Piping Rock Club. Uh, Sean, tremendous player, tremendous coach, uh, competed in the Irish Open, uh, competed in the Euro European Challenge Tour, Buy.com Tour, Canadian Tour, um, super player, super instructor, and then my very own boss, Danny Bailing, a fresh metal country club. Um, Danny certainly is one heck of a player in his own right as well. Competed in the Latin American Tour, Web.com Tour, uh, winner of the 2015 Guatemalan Open, five-time Met PGA Player of the Year, six-time cha PGA Championship participant, and last year, 2020 National Club Pro runner-up. So, um, first off, thanks, guys. Uh, again, really appreciate it. Um, to, those, to those listeners um, listening in, we urge everybody to ask questions. Uh, it's not every day that we get these four gentlemen um, together where we can kind of learn off each other. Um, I feel very confident that no matter the skill level, no matter if you're a player, coach, member, um, I feel very confident that everybody's going to take something out of this one. So I guess we'll open up, um, we'll open up this meeting here with um, kind of getting a better understanding on the four of you, how you prepare for a tournament. Uh, we're a week out. Um, what, what are you thinking? How are you getting your mind right? How are you getting your body right? Um, if you're using TrackMan, if you're using any measuring devices, specifically, what are you looking at? Um, maybe technology, are you making any tweaks? Are you taking into consideration what part of the country, what part of the world you might be going to? And I'm going to start with that question and shoot it right over to you, Daryl. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, and that's, uh, I, I think you, can, you can't be successful until you uh, have a game plan like that, uh, where you're playing. Uh, to just to know the weather, the, the climate, uh, the wind conditions, day in, day out, uh, to, to, to know how far the golf ball is flying, that, that's a big part. And that's what I think the great players do well. And I think that's what the great caddies can figure out very well. I think that's a, a big, big part of it is to have, it's a, you know, this day and age, it's all about a team. And uh, uh, the, the team goes, you know, with the, the fitness uh, guy, uh, your, your, um, the, the food, uh, your caddy, uh, uh, your mental coach. It, it, it's, it, it, it's such a big team nowadays. But uh, the more information you get, the better you're going to be at that. Now, uh, I think knowing the golf course is probably the priority uh, of, of anything. Um, one story that kind of comes to mind is one of my, of all my majors, my most successful major is after wearing myself out so many times, being so happy to be playing in a major, be playing 18 to 27 holes every day, then hitting balls all day, and being, by the time the tournament came, I was so exhausted that I finally learned uh, in the, at Boulder Straw in uh, – when I would play the PGA there when Mickelson won, I went into uh, our, our friend, um, Doug Steffen, and I sat down with him 
and we went through right through number one to number 18, how to play every hole, where to hit it, where to miss it, whenever the pin is on this side. And I had my most successful major, and he said two people did that that week, uh, me and Phil Mickelson, and Mickelson won. It's, it's a huge advantage to know the golf course and the conditions of how it plays. And with that local knowledge, uh, I've kind of made it a point to, ever since then to go in and talk to the system pro, whether you know it's a local event uh, in our section or wherever, to, to find out how the golf course is, uh, is played, what they hit on certain tees and everything. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good information. All right. Maddie, what about yourself? So, you know, the, the question is pretty specific. What do I do 10, 10 days out of the National Club Pro? And, and uh, I generally will increase the amount I'm playing. So I'll try and play more and hit balls less. Uh, I'll use tech. Uh, I'm a pretty techy guy, generally speaking. So I will use tech, uh, specifically the track man. I'll set the uh, altitude and temperature to what, what we anticipate it to be at the event and hit balls and try and gain an understanding of exactly how far the fly. That'll be sort of the extent to which I use technology, unless I see some sort of craziness going on in the ball flight, then I'll start taking some pictures and, and trying to figure it out. But I've noticed that when I, when I get down that route, generally the performances aren't as good. So I try to stay away from um, the video analysis right before an event. Um, you know, preparing my body. I don't do much to prepare my body for an event, as you can tell. <laughs> but, but, but I will say um, that what I do try and do is uh, get lots of sleep, and I try and drink a lot of water, and I won't drink any alcohol leading up to an event, uh, after the event, but but not not leading up to it. And those are the things that sort of have helped me play a little better you know, the last five six years. Um, Matt, what about um, your caddy? Do, do, is he doing anything specific um, as, as you're preparing for the tournament? Well, Mark and Danny can speak to this too. Mark is really uh, thorough and good caddies have a real clear understanding of where to miss it. And having 100% trust in that relationship is really important during an event. So... Yeah, a good caddy will, will look at a golf course oftentimes in reverse from green back to tee to try and understand exactly where the wide spots are and where the tight spots are and where the places to hit it and miss it are. The ability to be able to communicate information in a way that doesn't, doesn't throw off the player in the heat of the moment is sort of the key to being a great caddy. Right. Danny, uh, what about yourself? I think what uh, both Daryl and Matt said uh, were key and are key to, to what I do. I don't spend a lot of time on the range uh, grinding, hitting balls after balls. I like to play a lot more. I think the more I play, the better I get. Um, and I spend a lot more time on my putting um, and short game. Putting, training my, my stroke, and then working on my speed. Because when you go to these, these major championships, the greens are just very fast. And a lot faster than what we usually play on a court. So working on my ingraining my stroke, and then working on your speed. You know, playing in Latin America, we played in a lot of elevation. So uh, I would also, you know, try and, and work with my equipment. Maybe it's changing my driver uh, head to a ten and a half degree driver head or an eight and a half degree driver head, depending on how far the ball is going to go based on the weather, the altitude things like that. Um, you know, the PGA championships that I played in the States have all probably been at, at um, sea level. So I haven't had to do it for that, but I had to do it playing in Latin America a lot. Um, and like Matt said, resting, you know, trying to get as much sleep as possible. Um, I think I've probably worn myself out a lot at these PGA championships because you're so excited to be there because it's a celebration of our golf that we want to share with our friends and our family. And you just have so much adrenaline, which, which wears you down and makes you tired. So come that Thursday morning or Thursday afternoon, that first round, I've probably been exhausted and I, and I've hoped to learn from that if I get the chance to play in another major and, and hopefully I'll do 
some things a little differently going forward. Now, now Danny, for for the junior golfers out there, the, the guys who are going to play collegiate golf, um, maybe guys who are aspiring to play on tour, what what did you learn in, in your time at PGA Championships or National uh, PGA Championships? Um, what did you learn maybe then that you – put in place now maybe you were, you play too much too early or you practice too hard right off the bat was there anything specific there i think uh the main thing is is you i would always think and try to change something to try to make my game better real quick and i'd work on things whether it be video whether it be technology whether it be okay maybe I don't like my swing right now and I try to fix that. And I think that was probably the worst thing possible. Like, you know, I think being able to trust the process, trust what you've done leading up to the PGA championship or to a tournament, you've already qualified for it. So you know, you're good enough to play in it. Now just trust the process. Stop trying to change things. Just trust what you have been doing. Trust the swing that you have. It got you there and, and it's, Hopefully it'll it'll hold up under under the uh, circumstances and under the pressure that that comes with playing in an event. Um, but like I said, you know, playing in a PGA Championship it's a it's a circus or any tour event. There's a circus around you, and uh, not allowing that to kind of get in into your mind when you're there, trying to go about your business um, and just play the way that you know how to play and trust trust um, your game because it was good enough to have gotten you there. Right. I think that's important. Sean, what, what about you, Sean? Well, I think, listen, uh, the second one the guys have just mentioned, I would, I would follow that, um, that game plan pretty much the same way. I can get guilty of hitting too many balls and looking at too much video. Uh, so, you know, last year was a good year for me, and they were certainly a lot of the changes that I made, um, not hitting so many balls, pre-events, getting more into playing golf, getting my guys out, we play 21 on the chipping green and putting games. So I just went more into having games, you know, running into the event. Um, I think the other thing that, that's helped me, um, you know, as I said, mapping golf courses, I find Google Maps quite helpful. So basically coming up with a game plan before I step on property that I know the zones where I'm trying to hit the golf balls coming off of the tee. And once getting on property, you get a bit more familiar with the conditioning, if it's firm or soft. You start to see what's happening on the greens and where is where are the noble areas in terms of the mist. And try to be aware of that as I possibly can as as I play. And certainly having to be aware of that as well. My, my uh, that I use we're, we're you know, and, and so you need that support on the golf course and, you know, to have that guy backing you up and know where to hit the golf ball, where not to hit the golf ball. You know, the second one, Carl said as well, you know, it just reminded me of playing our show in the Valley Bunny, which was my, probably my best result in, in our national championship in Ireland. It's a pretty big European tour event. And my most successful one was when I played at my home course at Valley Bunny. So it gets into, I know the golf course as well as anyone can possibly know it. And so running into the event, it gets back to, well, I don't need to play a bunch of practice rounds. It's more of what am I going to do or not do. So, you know, to kind of second what Daryl said, I end up doing the least amount of play, the least amount of practice rounds, and then have my best event. So that's almost, a, you know, a, a lesson in, in of itself to kind of reiterate what Danny just said, of not overdoing it, um, over-preparing coming into the event and, and just kind of putting yourself out. Perfect. Now, now, definitely in terms of technology as well, prepping, what would I do in technology? Yeah. I try and dial in wedges, uh, just the yardages, try and get really good at those, get a good pattern in terms of what where that landing pattern is for driver, for my aiming and run out zone. You know, if, if I'm using SAM or, or, or Blast Motion, it's just to try and clean a few things up here and there, uh, but not to go too crazy. I know I'm guilty of that, so it's, it's to try and be, use it, but use it as functionally as possible. 
Is that uh, is that tough for you sometimes, Sean, to to kind of step away from maybe a typical training zone, and then when you're in a tournament, um, kind of go through it a little differently? I would say it's my biggest challenge. You know, I, I love to teach. I teach a lot, so I would so it's running through my mind all the time. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for me is to kind of step away from that analytical side and get into more of a playing mode, the acting mode. Uh, that for me is probably my biggest challenge. I think it's one of the things over the past season or two that I've done a much better job in, but it's been a very, very conscious effort for me to, to step back away from being so analytical and to try and just get into that playing mode. You know, and you know, thankfully I've had some help with that. But that for the question has probably been the biggest challenge for me personally. Right now, now Daryl, um, we just had a question um, in terms of how the four of you prepare um, on the putting green. So naturally, you'd have different screen uh, greens, maybe some different grass at times. Um, what what would you say to to the viewers at home, whether they're they're traveling to their buddy's club in the area? Uh, maybe going from New York to Florida. How how do you get a better feel for the greens before the event even begins? Well, you know, I always go with the theory that confidence breeds confidence, that you have to think you're a good putter before you're a good putter, and you got to be a good putter to think you're a good putter. So uh, you, 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 through training, and you're on whether it's even on your own putting green at, at, your, at your club, just the training that you're going through, the drills that you're going through, to build that confidence up that your stroke can handle the pressure uh, under those circumstances, it, it's, it's invaluable. Um, uh, and you, you'll do drills uh, to do this. You'll play games. You'll play. I remember uh, back uh, when uh, I was playing um, on uh, uh, a major championship and, and we, it was, it was like, I think it was Bob Tway. Uh, Ian Baker Finch uh, and a couple of other guys. We had this big putting match going, you know, for five bucks to go on, on, on uh, for nine holes around the around the putting green. Go for you know a couple of hours just playing games, trying to go under pressure, playing each other. Uh, it's it it uh, it really builds confidence to where you know when you have that five footer, you know, to try to save par, uh, win the tournaments uh, un, under under the gun. It, it means a lot. So you have to reflect back on past um, uh, successes to have that success. And so just preparing, whether it's on your own putting green or putting against your assistant pros uh, in a match or, or uh, doing your own homework to get ready for the qualifier, it's, uh, you reflect on those um, successes. Right. Now, now Danny, I want to kind of throw this question up at you. Um, this was from one of the assistants in the section. And I, I, know, I know the four of you have, uh, we got four head golf professionals here. So um, certainly balancing, practicing and playing with, with all the other duties that you guys carry. Um, the question is for, for the assistant pros that are looking to get better, um, to, that are looking to get their games closer to the level of you guys. Um, how, what's the best way from a time management standpoint that you found success? So when I worked at Sunningdale, my first job in the section, I lived at the club and I moved up here out of college. I didn't have that many friends or I didn't know that many people, I should say. So I, I practiced all the time when I wasn't working. Um, when I worked at Burning Tree Country Club in Greenwich, I was there for 10 years. I used to get there at 6.15 in the morning and hit balls until 8. I'd have to open the shop. And then whether I could go out and teach or go out and play with members or, or after the responsibilities that I had, I would spend more time playing, right? So I'd, I'd go in at 6, 6.15, I'd hit balls. At 8 o'clock, I'd go into the shop, open the shop, and let's say at 4, 5, 6 o'clock at night when I was done, I would go out and play as much as I could. Um, I would try throughout the day to get a 30 minutes, an hour here to go work on my putting, chipping, things like that. But as a young assistant, we had a lot of responsibilities. And there was a lot of things to do at the time. So I always did it. Be I always worked on my game before and after work. Um, and I think 
that helped me, you know, learn time management skills first off, but you know, I really wanted to play well. And I, and I, uh, I always looked up to Frank Benzel and, and Greg Descani in our area and Daryl Kessler, guys like that, that, that how did they get better? Well, they spent a lot of time playing and it was years and years of, of working at it. And I just thought that, you know, I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have any kids at the time and, and golf was my life and it is my life. And to get up early and, and practice, go to work and then practice at the end of the day. And by the time I got back to my room, it was, it was bedtime. Um, and I just think being able to, to prioritize your time and, and learn time management skills on when it is you can get out there and play and practice and if that's what you want to do, you really have to be committed to it. Right. Matt, what, what would you add to that? I would say that you need two things. You need to um, know what to work on, and then you need to have the tools to be able to work on it. Uh, information matters. Um, you know, what you're working on matters. It can affect your game positively or negatively, and you have to have discipline to be able to prioritize your life in such a way that allows you to address the inefficiencies and allows you to make what you're good at great at. Um, when I went to Deepdale, worked for Daryl, part of the reason I went there, really the whole thing was because of him and because I knew that he could help me become a better player. When I got to Deepdale, I thought I was pretty good. And, and, and I remember I went out and played for Daryl and a couple members one day and shot uh, a couple under, I think 68 or seven and, and maybe one five bucks and maybe I even beat Daryl and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And somebody came in the shop and said, you know, how'd you guys play? And and I started to talk and Daryl goes, well, Matt should have shot 58 today, but he shot 67. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, 58, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you missed that six footer on two and you missed that 10 footer on three and then you missed that 15 footer on six and then you didn't get up and down on nine. And I, and I didn't really realize what a good putter was, you know, until then. I didn't even know what it was until Daryl showed me. So um, if you want to get better, you got to know uh, what to work on, which isn't always easy. You got to know how to work on, which can sometimes be even more confusing. And then you have to have the discipline to do it. Right. You know, it's funny. We had uh, we had a college uh, panel um, about two weeks ago and Rich Mueller from Columbia brought a very interesting point up about his players. And that point was that his players, they knew what they were really good at and they seemed to only practice what they were really good at. And, you, you know, it took that discipline to understand to them that they're, they're good enough in that category to try to get better at these, at these other pieces. So I get, I guess just a little, uh, to go off track here a little bit with you, Matt is, um, Frank Darby just asked this question is, um, you, you mentioned stats. What, how, how are you keeping as an assistant or versus now as a, as a head golf professional, are you looking at specific stats? If so, how are you keeping your stats? I do keep my stats, but you know, stats are, um, stats aren't always easy to interpret. And, but, you know, again, I feel like I'm pretty numbers, but as I start inputting these things and looking for inefficiencies, you know, I had to bring somebody else to kind of really kind of guide me in understanding them. So um, there are a lot of avenues to do that now. They're not hard to find. Um, but I would, I would just say that at the assistant pro level, usually you have a pretty good idea of where you're, where you're lousy. Um, right. There's a reason for a reason we're assistant pro, you know, and it's probably because there's something that's not right. Um, whether it's a sprayed drive that goes out of bounds or, you know, too many missed three footers. Usually at our level, it's a little easier to fi fi figure out. But you have to be open-minded enough to to see it, and that's not easy. Right now, now um, Sean and Daryl, I'm going to change the question a little bit on you guys. Um, kind of. I was going to say, I was going to say, Sean is the king of the stats. He right. Knows every stat. So what I'm interested on the two of you is not only uh, not only discuss what you've seen in your game, um, but 
you know, the two of you have also mentored a lot of golf pros over the years um, and a very a lot of successful golf pros over the years. So I'm curious what you've seen um, within your staff and then what you've seen on yourselves just having the jobs that, that you have on um, maybe something that can help, whether it's a club pro out there or maybe even a club member. Uh, Daryl, if you don't mind taking that first. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you know, you, you're only as good as your staff. And, and uh, so you try to have, you try to surround yourself with really good people. And, and, uh, and so I think, you know, the great personality and the good work ethic uh, is, is priority in, in this business that, that we are in. And then, but, you know, not everybody has, you know, a, a superior golf game and, you um, uh, so that I feel like, you know, I try to help them in that category and, and my wife, Margie tries to help them in the, <laughs> the shop category. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, I make it, you know, like when Matt came to me, um, uh, I, I saw a, a big weakness in, you know, he's got, he's got tour level game, but he had, uh, assistant pro level putting uh, game. Um, uh, Kirk Satterfield, same thing, never really won anything. We grinded on him and he won a national assist assistance championship. You, you, uh, you try to get these guys and mentor them and, and try to tell them what's important, how to improve, what, to, uh, what, to, what they need to improve on and how to do it. And if you do that and it doesn't happen overnight, uh, they have to see the excitement in them that you're you're showing them and uh once you're, you're you know you're totally involved with them and they see that you're really trying to help them it, it really lifts them up and guides them in, in the right way to where they're their best uh, uh teacher and I, I i like seeing my guys go on to bigger and better things i tell them i, I don't want them here hanging around forever they've got to they've got to move on and luckily i've had uh some uh, pretty good guys uh, uh, move on uh, uh, to, you know, not just, you know, some great players, but then great jobs. So uh, it's uh, that, that I think is the number one priority, you know, I have won some nice awards and everything, but having my guys move on to uh, being a good mentor to them and move on to bigger and better things is uh, I think my, it's something I, a feather in my cap. Right. Uh, Sean, what, what do you have to add to that? You know, um, I think ultimately, uh, you know, we all love the game. And I think it's important. And it's one of the things that I love most about Dar is, uh, is the never wanting to stop, stop learning, the continue to learn, um, continue to bring passion to the job and the game. You know, I, I think that very important. It's certainly what we look for when you can build that team around you um, and that you ultimately that you know, you're part of the team as well. And so, you know, and that could mean, you know, the playing aspect. It could be like I've had my first assistant, Brian, has been with us for many years. And in terms of operations, he's incredible. Uh, in terms of a guy that you never have to worry about. Uh, he's just always there, and and I, you know, I'm learning from him, and I'm learning from Daryl, and I'm learning from my my old bosses working for Brian Peeper down the street, another incredible golf professional. Uh, that not only the passion, but just the dedication of uh, of, of of running the operation, and also taking the time. Uh, to work with you as an individual and as a, as a golf professional. Um, in terms of the playing side of it, uh, getting back to the stats and all of that, you know, how best you manage your time uh, to go back to what Danny said and, and, and then look for that low hanging fruit, what Matt said. And then, you know, if that's something you can work on yourself, great. If not, I know for me, I'll, I'll seek out guys that I know are better than me. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been incredibly generous with his time and his information. I think it's another trait you see with big golf professionals is that they're very generous with their time and their knowledge. Um, 
So I, I play as much as I can with Daryl. I play as much as I can with buddies, uh, Jason Karen, uh, Matt Dobbins, Mark Brown. I, I think you learn something from everybody. Um, if you're willing to look and if you're willing to sit back and, you know, I'm sitting here with my notebook. Uh, uh, gaining whatever I can gain from from the guys around me, I think there's always an opportunity to learn something, and these little nuggets can make the difference. Um, I know I've already picked up several things here that I that I will put into practice. And so, you know, just take. I, I think my my biggest piece from that is that we're always learning from one another, as much as we're trying to help an individual, we're also learning from how do they do well. Uh, even though, you know, I have guys on staff that are incredible players and I feel like I can pass something on in terms of bringing more of a systematic approach to their teaching, giving them more toolbox uh, that they can draw from when, when they are going down the road of the profession. But also what can I learn from them in terms of feeding uh, in playing, et cetera, whether or not that makes any sense or not. But uh, I, I, I think at the end of the day, you, you know, you never stop learning. Uh, at least you try not to. And always always look for an opportunity to, to make yourself better. Uh, as you do that, you have an opportunity to, to pass on to those that are not part of your team, part of the staff. All right. You know, and I, and I think you break – brought up a great question for a great point in, in that we're always learning off each other I personally think that's what makes our section the section that it is um, you know we have great players that flock up here we have great coaches that flock up here and I'm still I'm still in my in my short time back in the section maybe under 10 years now it's I haven't met anybody yet who's not willing to share that information um, and, and I think I think that's powerful because even on this panel alone, although all of you have the experiences that you have and the success that you've had, it's many different styles just on this panel alone. Um, and I think it's important to kind of talk to people that see things a little bit differently, right? You talk to three coaches, they see a golf, the same golf swing three different ways. And it, 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 that, that's kind of what makes um, it's these type of educational forums uh, so much fun, even even when they're not fully in person. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, Paul brought up a great question. Um, and I, I'm going to start it out with Danny um, first is a pre-shot routine question. Um, you know, the, the, the question is somebody who may lose focus. Um, wh what's the secret to staying consistent in your routine? Uh, how much do you practice routine? How much do you implement that in your, pra in your actual hitting balls? portion um, versus when you're practicing playing and how do you practice your pre-shot routine? You know, it's, it's tough to kind of get away from a, a pre-shot routine, whether it's putting, whether it's full swing, whether it's short game. Um, I'll go back to what I said before. It's just kind of trusting the process, you know, you sticking with something and having the, uh, the mindset to stay with that and not veer off, veer off course. You know, um, I have a certain putting routine that I practice on the putting green uh, before I play. And, and it's something that I really pay attention to um, when I am playing in big tournaments. It's actually something that keeps me more focused and, and probably calms me down is just staying with my routine, right? Especially on, on the putting green. Um, you know, getting there when there's, when you play in front of big crowds, it's not something that we do on a daily basis like the, the people on the PGA Tour. But when we get to a PGA Championship, you're out there with your caddy and you're alone and you could be in front of 10,000 people. And what is it that's calming you down and keeping you focused on the task at hand? And that is your pre-shot routine or, or any routine that you have, whether it's pre-shot or, or in-shot routine um, that you do. Um, how do you stay focused with it? I think it's just understanding the process and, and staying on course and trying not to, to veer off. Um, that's just what I, what I think about. There's a lot of self-talk that goes along with it and a lot of self-motivation um, in golf itself. But 
I do a lot of self-talk when I'm out there playing, and I think that helps me stick to that routine of mine, whether it be in the full swing or around the green. Yeah. Now, now, you know, what I've always – what I enjoyed the last year, Danny, watching you practice the few times that last year we had the opportunity <laughs> to practice is, um, is how committed you are to your game. And what I mean by that specifically is knowing your DNA to your game, um, not getting lost on trying to be the guy – uh, that hits it super long. You, you know what your game, you play your game very, very well. Um, how lo uh, When did you learn that? Is that something that you kind of always had? Is it, can, can you no, know? I think that's something that I learned probably back in 2013 or 14 when I started playing really well. And I think that's something that I watched um, guys in our section do, whether it be Mark Brown, whether it be a Frank Benzel, a Daryl Kessner, or Greg Viscani. I got to play a lot with Frank Benzel and Greg Viscani, and I learned a lot from them. You know, Greg doesn't hit it that long, but he hits it straight. He chips and puts it very well. Uh, Frank hits it sneaky long and puts it amazing. So I learned from them on how to play the game. And then I learned how to be confident in my own personal game, my own golf swing. There are things that I can't do. I can't hit it as far as Matt. Um, it just, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that, whether I hit the gym or I don't. That just has that speed that I don't think I can have, and I don't think a lot of people can ever have. Can I gain a few miles an hour here and there? Yeah. Um, but I, I'm confident, and I know that I'm going to hit it down the middle of the ferry with my driver 265 to 280 yards every time. And I have to, to like I said, stick to that, knowing that my short game and my putting are the best part of my game. So... If I go out to a 7,600-yard golf course in a major championship, I'm not grinding beforehand on my swing, on trying to hit it farther. I'm grinding around the greens because I know when I come to a 520-yard par four that I'm going to hit driver, three-wood hybrid, four-iron into it. And statistically and percentage-wise, I'm not going to hit the green most of the time. So I need to get it up and down. So back to that the statistics portion of what you guys were talking about before, I'm a big stat guy or a big numbers guy, but it's more of percentages and playing the percentage shot, right? Whereas I want to go for every par five possible because I want to make eagle. But percentage-wise and statistics-wise, when I get up to a 580-yard par five, I can't get there in two. And I have to know in myself and have that um, – self-talk, that self-awareness that as much as I want to try and hit my three with 270 yards to get it on the green, I just can't do it. Physically, I can't do it. So I need to lay up to that number and know that my wedge game is very good and to rely on my wedge game, to be able to hit it to, from 100 yards to 10, 12, 15, 6, 8 feet, and then you know, be confident that I'm going to make those putts 50 to 70% of the time. Right. Um, but again, like you said, you know, last year was a big year for me in, in a lot of different aspects with having a new family, having a new job and a new environment that I didn't get to practice as much as I would have liked. But when I did practice, I practiced those things that I need to be good at to, to succeed. And that would be my wedges, my short game, my putting. You know, I think we all kind of hit it. Everybody hits it fine. Some hit it a lot longer, some hit it a lot straighter. It's the guys that chip and putt it around the green that, that do better than, than the others, uh, in my opinion. Right. Matt, what do you, um, you know, I know personality wise, you guys are a little different, you and Danny, in that sense. Um, and, and what I mean specifically about that is kind of how you spend your time practicing, at least the time that I was around you and around Danny. Um, how, you know, we've all seen you play in terms of how well you stay focused um, from the minute you walk on property to the minute you leave. Um, when was that? When did you learn that? Is that something you learned in junior golf? And what can you kind of help the viewers with at home, um, especially the country club players on what they can do a little bit better at in this department? I think that the most important part for, uh, for making yourself better is is knowing who to compare yourself to. Danny hinted at it, but understanding that you should be comparing yourself to where you were yesterday, not to where somebody else is today. So what that means is 
is, you know, Danny, Danny, it's not going to do Danny good to try and hit it three yards in the air. He, he understands that that's not gonna be what makes him so good. You know, when I watch Danny play, a guy who is one of the best iron players I've ever seen. And, you know, I'm always sort of jealous of that. And I'm like, why, why the heck I can't, you know, why can't I do that? And, and so I spent some time trying to improve, prove that aspect without losing, um, without losing my advantage of, of, in other areas. And I think that's the trickiest part. So the guy that comes out, the guy that comes out to the club um, has to, has to earn what reasonable expectations are and he's got to learn how to address them. And he's got to be, again, he's got to be disciplined enough to be able to address them the right way and to not get caught up in all the noise that's going to be happening around them, buddies or, or you know, somebody else who does something better that he admires. Right. Sean, what, 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 do, you, what do you feel? In, in terms of the of how best to have the member? In that uh, yeah, for, from a routine standpoint, I guess first with you is, is how do you practice? Yeah, you know, I, I guess the whole point for me asking you for this question is I really love um, kind of how your brain works with, with all this stuff on how you take in information. So I'm curious on if you can kind of take us into the competition for you um, on, on what you're thinking in your routine um how, how did how do you practice your routine and if you can kind of elaborate a little bit more maybe a little bit on how that can help um our country club viewers yeah i think again for me personally the practicing of the routine for me uh, is is critically important again getting back to knowing myself that i get to analytic get to uh golf swing uh, um, orientated. So the routine aspect for me is very, very important. I know I brought this up with Daryl, my different Michael Hedron, probably in the last two to three seasons I started this because I knew it was disrupting my game negatively in terms of the competition because I do like to play. Uh, so that's kind of when I really started working on this. I, I focused down specifically on the on the putting routine and it pleased me how precise the routine was for him in terms of time, in terms of um, what was important uh, in that routine. And, and also getting back to both what Matt and Danny alluded to was how does that work for you? So a big part of that for me um, was to really strip down coming into the shot, the playing of the shot, the execution, and then post shot. So I'm not afraid to try and learn from other people. Uh, I will say that it's very, very, very important for me. Uh, I practice it. As I get closer to the event, I try and spend more and more and more time on my routine work. Um, and uh, that's going to different targets, short game, pitch, cutting, doing it with some pressure on what Daryl said earlier. So that's doing it with my buddies uh, and my staff as we do short game shots. I'm trying to do the exact same way as I would do on the golf course. And then I'm doing it with my members uh, when I play golf with them because I know the importance of routine for me. Um, so yes, I, I, I would say, and I'm, I, it's still something that I get better at. Uh, how well can I commit to that under the golf course? How well can I commit to that when I hit some cool shots? Do I go down the rabbit hole? Of, of hey, what did I do wrong there? I'm trying to fix it mechanically, and knowing that's going to get me out of my routine. So it's it's just a commitment to really grind on, on, on in your practice, and then more importantly when you play. Uh, getting on, how do you help the member? I think there's a level of honesty there in terms of managing expectations. 
Uh, when I watch the guys play, I think they could be more aggressive off the tee and far less aggressive uh, when they're hitting shots to green. In terms of being honest about how far do they really hit the golf ball and going at uh, going at flags or trying to curve golf balls. Um, and then uh, the putting, uh, I think, you know, listen, Barry can talk to this more effectively than I can, but in terms of green, green, uh, and, and speed, I think they're generally very poor at that. Uh, not generally, they are very poor in both categories, and that would be the area that they could improve on the most. So, you know, so having that, that conversation, you know, the, the, it, you know, at least I got it there. You know, that one drives me, I all have to bite my tongue. So, you know, how, how do you help the member? I think having those conversations and, and learning to be pretty brutally honest about it, being more aggressive off the tee, being less aggressive on their line uh, going into greens, and then having an honest conversation on um, uh, putting uh, and knowing that it's a lot more than, boy, you know, there's a terrible putt, Re really what was the error, and getting back to speed and uh, green reading. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Right. Um, Daryl, what, what do you have to add there? Well, I I, uh, I try to treat it. Uh, I try to get my, especially my young students, my uh, uh, college kids that uh, that are on the college teams or the high school kids, and then even my members. I I, I I try to explain to them that look at this: the number one ball striker on the PGA Tour averages thirteen point five greens of regulation, so they're getting it up and down four or five times. That's the best players in, on the tour. So they know how to chip and putt. So now, if you can't, you know, how many times are you going to miss a green or hit the green? Maybe nine, seven times? So you've got to be able to get up and down. Now, these guys, you've got to be able to chip it inside 10 feet because now the chances of a one putt goes up 60%. If it's inside, if you just chip it 15, 20, 30 feet, you're probably going to two putt. You're not, you're going to make a bogey. You're not going to save a stroke. And it's all about saving shots on the golf course. So um, that's what I'm trying to get across to them, uh, whether it's, you know, my uh, high schoolers uh, that's getting ready for a tournament and to right, right up straight to the membership that it's, you know, it's been a common uh, theme here between all of us. It's about the short game. It's, you know, uh, it really is. It's about that short game when you're preparing, but that's what's going to reduce the score in tournaments. Yes, we'd like to drive it like, Matt Dobbins, we like to iron it like Danny. I'd love to have a bunker game like Sean's, but what's really going to make us, uh, it, you know, win that tournament or be, or be successful is a good short game that particular day. All right. Now, real quick, before we conclude this, um, what I'd like to do is, and, and Danny, we'll start and work our way down again, um, is – during during these trying times where we're all stuck inside or, or at least at our homes, um, unable to get to the golf course, to to better um, have us prepared when the skies open up and we're able to play again, I'm just curious on what you would uh, what your advice would be to the average viewer at home um, that stuck home. Um, how, how can they practice and get a little bit more ready for when season uh, is it comes? I think uh, we have a lot of members that live in the city, so they probably don't get a chance to get out uh, side to be able to swing a golf club that much. So working on their putting and even just holding a golf club in their hand, a grip, working on their grip. You know, we see tons of grip errors or, or different types of grips that members have. And just getting a, a club in their hand so that, um, first off, they can kind of see the end in sight of when we can get back out onto the golf course and back to the club but also have their hands attached to something or attached to that club, um, get ready to swing. Um, so I would say that. And then, and then putting, of course, everybody can putt inside, um, whether it's, it's focusing on the face of the putter, lining it up to a straight line somewhere, or focusing on the speed, putting on a carpet inside and putting a ball, let's say, 10 feet away and trying to hit that ball and, and have good speed. 
Um, so I would say that's probably the easiest thing for our members that live in the city right now or, or live in a confined space. And then the ones that have, have property, get outside and, and work on your short game. Chip the ball around, around, the, uh, around your house. You get different lies. Everybody's grass isn't great. You're not going to have a perfect lie. So to be able to, to take that club that you use around the green, um, get used to the different lies that, that your actual, uh, you know, yard uh, gives you um, is going to definitely help you when you do get back on the golf course. Because as you know, there are no, there's no such thing as a perfect lie all the time. Um, so I think that's that's something that I'm doing. I'm I'm chipping and putting it around the back the backyard and, and in the house. Um, and besides chasing a baby around, you know, I'm ready to get back out there. <laughs> right, right. Um, Sean, what, what would you say to that? You know, in terms of what can I do personally, um, you know, you know, obviously it's a bit more black right now. So right. I, I have, to have to have a little bit of room down in the basement so I get some putting down in there. Again, just doing a little bit of sand work, um, a little bit of blast work, making sure my setup is the same way so I can kind of really knuckle down on some of the technical aspects and get out in the garden and uh, do training so I kind of just do that just on that um, side of it and then just hitting shots in a you know, little net so we can do some uh, just some wedge work with the launch monitor just some and just mapping down some yardages so uh, and then if you can do some physical work around the house uh, you get your bike down there so whatever you can do to try and try and basically just get up, up your butt and do it. Um, lastly, there's a lot of great information that people are sharing right now online. So, as a golf professional, just keep adding to the toolbox for when you go back to teaching or coaching. How can you help your membership? Uh, there's a real opportunity right now to, to grow your toolbox. So, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. No, I think I think that's great. Uh, Matt, Matt would, you know, what would you um, communicate to to your members, um, other members watching this? I would say that there is absolutely no reason why you couldn't come out of the other side of this thing a better putter. I mean, you, you, this is the time to really, really grind on technique. Um, so if you kind of have an understanding of what you want to do with your stroke, I would suggest every person to set up the same type of putting station that Daryl has set up in his garage, which is an outline of feet floor, a spot on the floor where the ball goes, and you get it exactly perfect, and you practice getting in and out of that. And that's what I have on, what's what I've been doing for the last seven years, and it's taken me from a horrible putter to a pretty good putter for the most part. And then the other thing I would say is uh, you can grind on your grip. There's no reason why your grip wouldn't be perfect coming out of this thing. I mean, imagine if I told you, you have one month of doing nothing else but working on your grip. I mean, goodness gracious, why wouldn't everyone have a perfect grip? And then the last thing I would suggest is if you can chip it off carpet in your basement, you can chip it anywhere. The tightest surface in the world, a nice tight carpet surface, just, you know, try not to kill anyone or break any ankles. But if you can learn to chip it off that kind of a surface, like Danny could probably do it with his eyes closed, I bet you you come out and when you get a tight lie on the first hole in the spring, it's like nothing. Right. Right. And, and I, I think I think that was gold right there, specifically on the putting. Um, there is, you know, no matter where you're living right now, you have room to work on your putting stroke, certainly room to work on your, on your setup. Um, distance from ball. Um, Daryl, what, what would you add to that? Uh, I mean, just just what Matt said. Uh, I mean, um, I think uh, in improvement, you need feedback. If you need feedback, and it, uh, if you get feedback on whether you're doing something correctly or not, uh, you're going to know your tendencies, what they are, uh, uh, incorrectly or correctly. So, um, you know, 
with mine. I put, I put, uh, I had the putting rug and I put the gate, the gates out in front there on a, on a lot. If you can't get it through the gate, you know, that's 10 inches out in front of you. How are you ever going to make a three footer? Uh, or roll it down a ruler or a yardstick. Uh, the training aids, the best training aids are inexpensive and simple to use. You get a ruler at Ace Hardware, you put the, the ball on, on the end of it, you put it up against the end of it right there and roll it right down the ruler. If it doesn't go down there, your face isn't square. That's 90% why you're going to make or miss the putt is putter face control or, or lack of. Um, I, I did a drill for Taylor Bay to, on, on chipping and uh, indoors. Well, you could do it uh, with regular golf balls outdoors, but indoors you put three ping pong balls, one in the sweet spot, one just off the toe, one off the heel, a quarter, two inches behind the ball, a quarter, two inches in front of the ball, and then you learn where your bottom of the of the arc is. If you if you hit the two inside balls, you hit it way out of the toe, bad uh, distance control. If you hit the two outside balls, you hit you hit a shank. So uh, if you hit the first quarter, you hit fat. Uh, second quarter, you hit thin. You need feedback. So little training aids like this can can help fast track progress, uh, and and they're inexpensive and easy to do, and they're they're all over the internet. Try to try to improve. Uh, thank you. I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you guys more on that one. I think I think that's uh, specific and. To your guys' point, I think, I, th I think this is such a great time to get better. Um, and, and we're still in early April here, um, so it's a nice time to get some, whether it's a grip, whether it's a posture, whether it's distance from the ball. There's so many good things that we could be working on right now. Um, so I just want to thank, I want to thank all of you um, for joining in. We really appreciate it. Um, certainly had a had a lot of views here. Again, just to reiterate, we're going to be uploading this onto the Fresh Metal Golf Academy 2 page. Um, Matty, that's new, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, so we're uploading them on there as well as the remainder of our webinars uh, during this time. Um, just to let everybody know, tonight at 7 o'clock um, through Zoom as well as Facebook, we're speaking with Jamie Lovemark and Chris Como, um, with my two partners, Sarah Stone and uh, Colin Averill. Um, the premise of that one is just to discuss what it's like to actually be a PGA Tour coach, what it's like to be a PGA Tour player, um, kind of the, the ups and downs that goes with that. And then also on the 15th, we have Dana Delquist, Andreas Cali, and Brian Cregan. Um, to get us started off with a, with a nice lineup after that. So, again, guys, couldn't even tell you how much it means to me having you on here all together, um, taking your time out of your days and your family's days. Um, and I, I really think we have some really good nuggets out there for, for a lot of viewers. So thank you. Appreciate it, Joe. Thank, thank you, Joe. All right, gentlemen. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. All right. Bye-bye. You too. Take care.